Great. So um, I hope that you are not too overwhelmed with all the experiences, you know, not just for this course, but everything else. I can, last night, I realized that half of you have, have too many things on the table and you're really stressed with how things are going. Um, just, I, I would just recommend you to relax and do your best and, um, and then just wait for, I hope, a happy result. Uh, today we're kind of discussing, I think these are the things that I kind of come back to because I discussed them in chunks and I've kind of tried to give the solution right there. But when I speak with some of you, I realize that because I haven't put it under a certain title, you think that we haven't studied it. Um, and I just wanted to bring all of this together to, to make sure that we now have a picture where we have overemphasized on the sources of pollution. And now in this lecture, we'll kind of try and overemphasize on the sources to control or treat the pollutants that we've been talking about. And, and you know, what would, if you were somebody, and this question's for everyone, if you were somebody who had to take care of pollution and this pollutant could not be air pollutant only, just think of any pollution, form of pollution, how would you like what would you appro your approach to the treatment would be uh, would be so let's say there is a pollutant in the environment what will you do first if you want um, to get rid of that pollutant from the environment Rafi I'll study its sources where it comes from and uh, how how that can be prevented, I mean, what's the source? Okay, Hassan? I think the first thing uh, after uh, nailing down the source would be to check whether, uh, like let's say we're making bricks, right? So I, I would check whether there are any alternatives available, whether we even have to produce that many bricks, or is, the, is there some other way that we can also provide for like construction material? Great. And um, Manal. Manal. I think assessing the damage is also very important, like uh, in the in the region to see whether how much of it is reversible and how much of it is just completely hopeless. So I think assessing the extent of the damage is also very important. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Somebody else has raised their hand. Eamon Prehman. Also, like observing patterns, right? Because in certain areas there is certain uh, there are certain kinds of pollution, right? So just like generally observing patterns really helps locating what the source is. Yeah, Taha. Uh, another thing I think it has some significance is that uh, you, you also want to look at where exactly it is polluting at, whether it's in is in center of cities or whether it's in a far out area. How much of it people regarding that great so i i think i i, I sorry if i missed somebody and they had raised their hand early okay now um you know you you were all right um and and you know of course that would be a bigger exercise for us to think what should we do first and how should we organize this but let's say that i am a brick kiln owner and i am producing bricks at whatever numbers that are being expected of me but there is a problem and that is that while I support some poor families in the process and produce bricks and you know make income for myself and others, uh, the end of the pipe has pollutants. Now I want treatment for that pollutant. So let's say in this case it's the smoke that is coming out of the stack, the chimney. So what should I do now? How should I treat it? Or what should I think? Like what should my thinking process be? Thumbs up. I mean, like, uh, uh, filter the air inside the chimney and then release it. Like, that is the best option. Yeah. So, end of the pipe. This is called end of the pipe approach, right? A lot of people say that when you are thinking, so you, to, to address pollution or solution for pollution, there are multiple ways to look at it. So, if it is a pollutant um, and source, so for example, if we're talking about fossil fuels, you know, here, um, someone might have asked me, what is your source of fuel? how do you fire the bricks and maybe given me a proposed a solution there 
uh, someone else might have said, okay, because you don't have an alternative to this, even if you're using clean fuel, you're still going to have some smoke in the air, or even if you don't have smoke, you're still going to release some gases into the atmosphere. This is what you should do. But whatever we do, it has to be close to this source. You know, it has to be close to wherever we are. Um, so if, if I am someone, if I'm in the government and I'm making decisions on how, how should we propose a solution to this, and I'm asking, uh, the funding body to let's say propose a treatment or cleaning of the air project miles away from these projects or miles away from these industries then would that be wise so i think there are a lot of those questions which you know perhaps before science or with science you need to ask yourself uh, is, is it the raw material is it the process is it the end of the pipe is it the you know you know how should you look at getting rid of, of emissions and making sort source that you treat it making sure that you treat it close to the source. Um, so that's the approach, you know. And um, in case of air pollutants, let's say if we are looking at any kind of pollutant, it's generally categorized into two. And uh, those two are either called gaseous uh, pollutants or particulate matter that we've been studying a lot, or at least mentioning a lot in, in, in a lot of our presentations. And there are various technology is already out there. And I've mentioned some of these, but I'll still highlight some of these again today for you to kind of relook at what this is. So exactly what took place um, here. And maybe at, at some point, if we have time, we can do an activity where you propose um, a solution to one of these um, sources of smoke. So what I've basically done is I've picked up all the sources of smog that we discussed in one of our presentations, and I'm only thinking about those. These are perhaps more suitable for industrial setups or power plants or places that use excessive fossil fuels and have those infrastructures and that kind of technology that can facilitate this, but that doesn't stop us from, from using these in others. Anyways, we're categorizing air pollutants into particulate matter and gaseous pollutions. A gaseous pollution and we've already read them in our previous presentation but there are now other categories that are emerging in so despite the scrubbers adsorbents absorbents which we'll discuss in a while you know mist collectors generally come with the scrubbers or the filters uh, but they're also coming in separately as well and something which is kind of more related to environment and environmental sciences is the bio-based solution or nature-based solution um, and that's uh, called biofilters, where you have a filtration process where microorganisms are also adding in into the process of degradation of the pollutant. Uh, but by the way, just to, to ask you guys, can you think of a pollutant and then think of how that would become, how it's harmful and how it would become less harmful? So let's say, yes, Iman. Uh, an example of a pollutant could be sulfur dioxide. It's harmful because uh, it can cause acid rain and the way it could be reduced is through flue gas desulfurization, which is like uh, you can, in the chimneys, you can put like a filter which scrubs the sulfur dioxide, making it less harmful. Great, yeah, amazing. Yeah, that, that's what we'll, we'll, these are the things that we'll look at, right? So what are we using? Are we using any chemical form? What is the chemical doing to the sulfur? How is it reacting with it? What is it turning it into? You know, those, those, those questions. But this time we'll give it a name. Is, is sulfur dioxide reacting with lime? What is lime? And then what will be the final product and how, how that is less um, harmful than, than the original product? Aman, you have a point? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Ma ma in this kind of smog, there is a uh, large concentration of carbon. And recently I visited the factory side of Lahore. और मैंने वहां पे देखा था कि एक बंदे ने अपनी फैक्ट्री की बैक साइड पे ना इस तरह स्मोक निकल रही थी उसने इस चिमनी के आ, कवर किया हुआ था आ, एक दीवार बना के तो मैंने उसे रीजन पूछा था उसने कहा था कि जो कार्बन वेस्ट हो रहा है हवा में जा रहा है तो वो कमरे के अंदर स्टोर हो जाएगा और उसी को रीयूज कर देंगे yes. और बाकी जो गैस है वो साइड से निकल जाएगी सो वी कैन रीयूज द कार्बन इन द स्मोक हाउ मेनी हाउ मेनी हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू हैड द टाइम टू लुक एट द वीडियो दैट आई सेंट यू ऑफ टाइम did anyone manage to? Uh, I want to ask somebody new. Ikra. 
Okay, so um, in that video, um, where it, like the he, I don't know where, who the like who was the uh, guy that uh, like uh, he told that um, he was trying to uh, solve the problem of smog. Uh, he said like there is so much smog and we are uh, industrializing. We are uh, increasing our um, increasing our like industries and all in the China. Uh, where there is so much manufacturing uh, and but our air is not clean so how we can clean the air and how what initiatives we can do so he thought a uh, um, initiative that a filter which is uh, which can take the air suck the air and um, like absorb the uh, all the carbon and release like the clean air to the uh, environment and he, uh, after two years, um, he developed uh, the like the large filter uh, at the like, uh, and placed it at the part where he um, where uh, where he uh, like where the uh, air um, goes to like in a filter uh, in a narrow scale and with that like with with, with uh, by using like the electricity which is like around uh, water boiler and uh, with the positive ionization and uh, release all the positive uh, all the clean air to the environment so yeah um, okay i was in the audience when when he gave that talk and i think in that one hour lecture that he gave he probably taught me more than most of the teachers who've taught me in in my in my courses and, and this is with all due respect to the teachers right but i think the way he, he said it and the way he thought um, and again, I think this is why I, I keep encouraging all of you to think about the environment because he's an artist. So he just thought about the possibilities, thought about design, and then, you know, talked to people, talked to scientists, just gave a wild idea and threw it to many scientists and engineers. And they, some of them said this is possible and he eventually was able to, to do it, which, which was basically just hoovering the air. So just how you hoover the carpet, he was basically hoovering the air and kind of getting the smog. And at, at that point, I think instantly it was a great solution and also thinking that he was creating those. So you know how people say that when the air is not clean, even if you're going to the park, it's not really good for your health because you're still taking in all of that smog. But he was by putting these filter, creating the, those spaces which were more clean than rest of the city. So automatically it became that public space for everyone to come and enjoy with 100% guarantee that, that they will have better air than the rest of the city and then also contributing to, to the city you know by after um, after the project was was uh, had finished or evolved um, to, to buy all of those products that were made from that compressed um, carbon so i think it was really really interesting uh, it really inspired me i hope it, you took out something from it as well uh, uh, well, but but i would really encourage you to watch the entire video because there are a lot of other things that he's doing um, that that might interest you as well but because the discussion is going to be majorly smog and smog oriented i thought you should watch minute 10 to 20. all right so uh we just had this discussion um to reduce pollution we will think about either changing the raw material we will think about changing the process is there anything that's wrong with the way we're doing things um, and there is something that you know the process has changed for brick in industry recently in pakistan and india and I'll give you the task to look up what that is. And then past that, of course, as Hamza said, we, we can think about changing the equipments, bringing in more efficient equipments, bringing in uh, pollution control equipments that are already designed, that are already present in the uh, market. So it's not like you have to design and innovate something yourself. All right. And so let's say that we have all of these um, particulate matter in the air, and that's the pollution. And there are various gadgets available in the environment, such as electrostatic precipitators, cyclones, filter bags, settling chambers, which can get rid of that particulate matter in your indoor environment or um, in the air. Then, but how do you know that this is the technology that's doing it for you? So I think something that I haven't really taught in detail to you, but I would still like to mention is the fact that you know you you would still check the efficiency it's not like you put a gadget on and you say this is it it's, it's the solution you have to do you have to continuously monitor it to see that it's actually reducing 
what it says it's it's reducing whether that's a particulate matter 2.5 or even below um, and to do that you would um, put certain gadgets on get the quantity uh, from you know what actually was in the air and then what you have after you've put that gadget so it's, it's just for you to to know that you you can go beyond this as well and to start with settling does anyone does anyone want to guess what it is because it's very straight away um, treatment technology for air so let's say that there's an air which is um, smoke laden or particulate matter laden and uh, and you put a settling chamber. Nadia. Uh, Ma'am, I don't exactly know what it is, but uh, after by seeing the pictures, I can uh, I can guess. So uh, basically, when we burn things out, okay, so they give out smoke. So they create these uh, long chambers where the particular matter just set, settles down, or it sticks to the uh, linings of the chambers. So that way, the, we can uh, reduce the amount of uh, particulate matter that we can send out to the uh, mixed with the smoke. Yeah. So if you're basically using the concept of gravity, because the, if it's if it weighs, if it's uh, weigh, weighs enough, and you are not allowing it to interact with the air, so so that the air just takes it away, at the source you have provided this chamber. Of course, this can be a simple pipe that you put at the end of your stove. Um, in the north or in the south, or it could be a proper chamber that's put in the industry. So if, let's say the particulate matter is really high. I once went to a millamine factory. So, you know, millamines used to make these um, crockery close to plastic. I went there and I, I wanted to look at their health and safety conditions. And I went there and it, the air was just filled with particles because they're using all of those gadgets in a small factory in Pindi. It was just filled with the dust, you know, and it was definitely above uh, 50 micron because it was absolutely visible to, to the eye, it was big enough, it was settling. But for that short period of time, it was staying in the air and all they were all covered from head to toe in, in that uh, melamine dust or the melamine raw product uh, powder. And, um, and you know, th those kind of things can easily be directed to a pipe or, or then to a gravitational settler or a settling chamber where you allow the gravity to, to kind of collect it or give it the time to settle through gravity. And then at the end, you have these dust collectors or um, hoopers, as you call them in, in the industrial terms. Quickly again, if, if anyone of you knows anything about any of this and would like to talk, um, you're more than welcome. Before I talk about cyclones, maybe I can talk about electrostatic precipitators. So two, two things. Uh, can yeah. I talk about it? Electrostatic pressure. Uh, yeah, ahead. so go ahead, Abhi. Uh, yeah, so uh, I in the previous slide I was I had my ra hand raised and I was going to talk about the same thing. I came across a, te a similar technology in which, like, uh, in in the brick kings, in the chimneys of the brick kings, uh, kings they had like uh, they had some technology. Uh, through which they like gave a negative charge to the uh, to the uh, sulfate oxides and the and the, and nitrate oxides and and the nitrates and while they were like leaving the chimneys there were uh, these cathode uh, trays which uh, which were positively charged and these attracted these negatively charged uh, particles so this reduced the amount of like uh, of these oxides uh, in the air by 90% and they they were and this used to stick with these plates and they, later they could like easily wash them off from those absolutely so who is basically this is the simple remember when you were all kids and we just used to take a balloon and then rub it against our um, clothes and then put it and it would stick to the wall does anybody remember it raise your hands if you've not, if you've done it just raise your hand so that i know that you're you had a proper childhood. Oh, you, a lot of you had a proper childhood. That's great. Um, what were you doing there? That was absolute science, right? You were creating static charge. And that's why that balloon was able to stick to the wall. All right. And that's what you do at the for the electrostatic pre precipitators as well, or in the electrostatic pre precipitators. That same principle is used, where you have the negatively charged rods um, that 
create that static charge, which, so give a negative charge to the particulate matter. And then ahead of it, you have cathode, which then allows the, the particulate matter because it's charged to go and stick to it and then clean air would filter out. So of course, someone who had developed it might have developed it with that same simple concept as well. You know, how you can use that concept from the childhood to then bring it to um, solving world's air problem. Um, and then, uh, so, so that's that. If you have any questions, if you don't understand anything you want to discuss more, raise your hands and let me know. There's a lot. I'm not talking a lot about the design. I'm not talking a lot about the applications because I think, and the advantages and disadvantages and the costs, because I think that will waste a lot of time. So I'll just talk about the working principle and, um, and then we, we, we can go ahead. Now do you have a question. I, mean, I, just, I just wanted to confirm like to what extent do we need to know these terms i mean i really don't didn't understand this electrostatic precipitation process so do we need to go over um, ourselves or you are going to expand on that i'll, I'll expand i'll expand a little more on it okay Okay, so what about fabric filters? There's a very, there's a, there's a gadget in your house that I ha have also mentioned in the presentation that uses fabric filter and you use it kind of every day in your house or every other day in the house. Does anyone know where, in which particular home application do you have a fabric filter for cleaning purposes? Okay, how many of you, there you are. Ma'am, is it in like the vacuum cleaners that we use? Yes, it is the vacuum cleaner. So if you have never opened it and looked uh, at what's inside and, you know, if you've never wondered how, how it works, if you've never really looked at it, today is the day. Um, or maybe tomorrow morning you can just help your mothers um, or your maids help the house, uh, clean the house. Just take the uh, hoover, open it, see all the components, clean it, look at how the filter bag is and basically that's the principle which is also applied in the industrial application where you're allowing the air that contains dust to go in and then kind of filtering the, the air out um, and then capture the dust and that dust is contained in that filter bag and you just take it, take it home. Um, vacuum cleaners. Okay, um, all right. Uh, and then also there's the cyclone. So all of these are just, you know, you would always look at them as machines. Um, you wouldn't really know what's inside, but the working principle I think is important. If you don't know that, then there's no point in, in, in knowing the names. Um, cyclones, again, is where you, with, with the dirty air is going in, with the particulate matter, you're allowing the centrifugal force, so you're like allowing it to travel, whirlwind. And then when the particles hit the wall, um, they, they slow down and then they go and settle. Um, so, so that's what's happening here. And, and I think the, the arrows kind of help you through that as well, that the dust is settling down, the cleaner is going in, uh, going up, um, and everything else I think is pretty, pretty clear. Uh, but as you saw, this, the settling chambers had higher micron sizes, and then as you go further up, the micron size will go down. Um, so um, there's another graph that we'll see, but um, before that, I would like to discuss scrubbers as well. So up until now, other than Nadia's question, does anybody else have a question? Uh, Ma'am, I do. Go ahead. Yeah, so basically we've been talking about how air pollutants can be, you know, sort of the effects of air pollutants can be mitigated from the environment, right? So I was sort of wondering whether that could be done through, you know, um, biological means or like, you know, bioremediation or something like that. So do you think uh, there are any, you know, certain types of plants or organisms that can be planted near the site um, from where the um, you know pollution is being excreted to like sort of you know mitigate the effect yes yes absolutely so both for indoor and outdoor environments the first thing that you ever ask any urbanization planner would be please put trees on the roadsides and that's exactly the principle so the principle would be for them to kind of absorb as many pollutants as they as they can. But there's a downside to that. So we'll be discussing the biofiltration part of the air as well in, in some of the later slides. Uh, but yeah, and, and they're quite clear. So if you just Google like, what kind of plants should I keep in the home if, if I, for, for cleaning the air? And similarly, what kind of plants should be put in the, in the environment? 
yeah, I, I mean, I have mixed feelings about it, but, but I'll, I'll leave that for that. Um, but then after all of these, so it's, it's very simple. I think I need to summarize it because I, I feel like I've made it slightly difficult for you to, to, to understand it. So the, the particles are large in size or they can be very small in size. In the industry, the particles can be a nuisance. So it depends on what they are and it depends on what they contain and we want to contain it. As, as Aman said, it can be something valuable. It can be a carbon particle, it can be a suit, it can be something else that perhaps is a resource for that particular industry. So a lot of industries actually capture it because that waste particle or suit is a resource for them. Some capture it because it's a nuisance and they do not want to create harmful impacts on the environment. So if the particle is bigger, they could just go with giving them that chamber, which would allow them to settle um, over the settling chamber using gravity. Or they could just give that air current, um, use the centrifugal force, so allow the uh, particles to hit the wall of a cyclone and then slow down and then eventually settle. Or they could just use a filter, mostly fabric filters are used. There can be glass and wool, uh, uh, and cotton and all kinds of fabrics as well. Depends on what kind of strength do you want and what kind of characteristics do you want because some chemicals can, can damage the fabric. So let's say you're just simply filtering out exactly how you filter your clean water, your, your boiled water out, but this is a different kind of fabric. It's, it's, it's smaller uh, pore size. Um, so that's that. And then um, electrostatic precipitators, as we said, it's basically charging the particulate matter. So the particulate matter is inert. It doesn't have a charge. It's that just there. You are autom you're giving it a static charge. Um, and the static charge meaning you are, you know, waking it up um, and, and telling it to, to, to have the charges towards outside. Basically, I think the balloon is a better example. So just like the, you're asking a balloon to charge, develop that charge st um, statistic, st statically so that you can then introduce another uh, plate that could take care of that particular uh, particulate matter and then the clean air goes out. But all um, particulate matters are not that easy. To, it's not just dust, right? So it can be something difficult as well. And when that happens, you introduce water. So there's the concept of wet scrubbers where you introduce water, make it a part of the water and then treat it. Um, and, and that process is generally called. So basically the water weighs it down and washes it and allows only clean, water, uh, clean air to go up because air would just um, escape anyway. And different kind of cartridges and filters are used. Um, let's not discuss it here. And uh, so, so this, is, this is it, Nadia. It's, uh, basically you need to remember these two. Um, if, if, if I talk about it and not, not like cram it, but just know the concept that what is happening um, and why is an electric field being applied uh, and how's that static charge being developed and then how does the clean air come out? Uh, and for scrubbers as well, like this is a cross current, it could be you know, co-current as well. Um, so ju just know that these are very easy, easy scientific ways that have been used in bigger gadgets to solve bigger um, problems of, of air and environment. And, and for example, if I say that we have to take care of Lahore's air, we know that the particulate matter 2.5 is really high. So depending on what the particle size is, if I tell you what should we install at the industries today and you say settling chamber, that won't be the answer because we have a very high particulate matter uh, of uh, 2.5 uh, micrograms per meter cube. So maybe like in terms of microns, you need to think about, you know, maybe stay in this range to make sure that the, the air in Lahore is clean. So just for you to make those decisions based on what the uh, size of the filtration process is. Now let's jump to the gaseous pollutions. Who can re quickly recall the gaseous pollutions that we, uh, pollutants that we've already studied in the course? Somebody else? Manal? Um, so there was uh, sulfur dioxide and then uh, va variants of um, like nitrogen, like noxes, nitrogen uh, dioxide, um, I think ammonium nitrate. Um, and then there was uh, carbon, various uh, types of carbon, like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, methane, which were, which were greenhouse gases. 
Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. I think variations of um, phosphates, uh, phosphorus uh, gas. Um, I'm trying to think of, I, I think that's it. I'm, I'm not sure if I've missed anything. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll not. I'll not discuss what you mentioned further. But basically, we we talked about those um, classical air pollutants. Yes, um, and that includes ozone and CFCs and all all, all the rest. Um, and you know, we, we can talk about what is being released excessively from where and how and where it's impacting people or environments. But generally, you categorize them into you know SOxes, NOxes, hydrocarbons, and then other gases could include ozone. Um, Etc. that are released or are a byproduct of, of uh, industrial processes. The same uh, equipments could be applied here as well. It's just a different principle. And uh, maybe the chemists should finally speak up if, if they want to. Uh, so basically what you're trying to do is now, the, you know, in, in the particulate matter capturing process, we were just allowing the gases to pass through because we were saying it's, it's oxygen and nitrogen, whatever, it's not harmful. But now we know that it contains these gases and we have to capture these gases as well, which means that you have to stop the air. But, but you can't really stop the air, right? So how do you stop these particular gaseous pollutants by dissolving them in water, if they are soluble in water? Not all of them might be soluble in water. So then, of course, what happens is perhaps these scrubbers would have some water, they would capture these, and then they would react with something, or maybe you'll, um, I think as someone rightly mentioned, the walls would have certain chemicals. There would be a bed. So maybe these uh, scrubbers would have a packed bed where peat or compost or activated carbon, which is again carbon, would be used to absorb these. Just keep it on its surface, not allow it to escape with the air. So it could either absorb it, absorb it uh, so for example, take it in, like dissolve it in water and then treat it, or it could simply absorb it. That is allow it to attach to the surface of that bed and then only allow for clean air to pass through. And again, these are not very difficult uh, scientific principles. You just use their characteristics. Uh, and these are all very established, well-established concepts as well. But uh, I forgot who mentioned how sulfur is taken care of. But you know, sulfur, well, sulfur lime is, is, is an absorbent. Um, it it uh, reacts with it to make calcium sulfate, which is less polluting. But there's a problem with this, um, with the equation. And I think, Adeen has already mentioned it, so I'll not, I'll not go there. A lot of these combustion and other equations, uh, other uh, solutions have byproduct, which is uh, water and carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is itself a greenhouse gas. So even if you're reducing one pollutant, which perhaps could be, um, could be difficult, you're still creating another pollutant. But the good thing is that carbon dioxide is easy to capture with plants. So if we plant more, then perhaps we could capture this. And this is a more dangerous one compared, compared to this. So I think by creating the carbon sinks, having those agricultural practices that we discussed in the course, uh, maybe we can take care of some of these uh, pollutants. Any question here, guys? Because I can't hear you and it, you know, it confuses me whether you're understanding what I'm saying. So this particular slide is for the chemists, uh, I wouldn't get into details here because I think you're already scared. Um, also, we've discussed incineration. So someone has to remember what incineration is and tell me what it is. Anybody else? Azhan, where are you? <laughs> Okay, Iman, have you spoken? Ra um, Iman can speak, yeah. Uh, it's, when you, it's when you burn waste material. Yeah, so we basically burn, burn waste material. And like I said, in the process of combustion, CO2 is still released, right? So as, as it correctly says, so for example, what is, what is wood? Wood, which is biomass, is also cellulose, and cellulose is basically a hydrocarbon, which means it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So when I say that there are various hydrocarbons, like I'm giving you a very easy from your day-to-day -day life example, 
but these hydrocarbons could vary, you know, and they could be more difficult hydrocarbons. And, and those hydrocarbons are basically just put in um, into these incinerators at a very high temperature and pressure. We burn them, and when we burn them, we um, release not just carbon dioxide and water, but a few other flue bases as well. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's still better than, I think, sending all of that waste into landfills and then all of those gases into the air. It's still better uh, than, than that. Uh, and of course, you can use direct flame uh, combustion. So what you see at the end of a landfill, so when a landfill is closed, there's always a chimney or a pipe that has flame. That flame is basically the biogas that's being released from, the land, from inside the landfill. So that would be a direct flame combustion. You're just burning it. Um, but you could do, do the same in the incinerator as well. Uh, and sometimes it's catalytic combustion. Yes, Azam, do you have, do you want to say something? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I just want to add something. Go ahead. Um, so, thank you. So the thing is, you are mentioning uh, greenhouse gases or stuff like that, but I just want to comment that you didn't mention uh, water vapors. Uh, because I feel like uh, most of the students don't consider water vapors as a greenhouse gases. Uh, so would you uh, talk about this as well, uh, like how to incorporate this? Because uh, you, you know that uh, water vapors are also are active and they absorb uh, radiation and causing uh, global warming. So just you mentioned. We, we systematically... but I think it's too obvious. Yeah, I think we systematically do that. And the then, like, uh, like you mentioned, carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases. But I feel like uh, water is also a major uh, contributor. It is, it is. And I think a lot of the counter argument on these gases is the fact that it's actually, it's actually also does absorb water, but that's its ability, right? We, we say the same thing for ocean. We say it's, it, it absorbs the heat releases for all, all, all water bodies that are present on Earth. They capture, store heat, and then release it slowly at night. Um, similarly, the water vapors that are present in the air act as a greenhouse gas because that vapor is now in a so steam is basically, so like we say, water has three forms, right? So that's the gaseous form, um, or um, let's say if, if it's just in the condensed form in the air, it would absorb water because that's its ability. Uh, we, we studied the characteristics of water, that's its ability. And I'm not going to deny this. I know a lot of um, science proves that it's so much more, um, it has the ability to absorb more heat as well. But I think... I generally do not want to sway away from the discussion of the pollutants that we are actually putting in the air because the water vapors in the air are a part of natural water cycle. And, um, and that water, natural water cycle has, unless we are, uh, human activities are increasing the water vapors, which in some case we do. For example, an aeroplane could release a lot of water vapors and they could also increase um, warming of, of the atmosphere. But I think because A, it's a part of the natural process, so the natural water cycle process, and B, it doesn't have any secondary effects. Uh, if someone tells me that, you know, uh, forget socks or, or forget methane, water, water is equally a, a, a greenhouse gas or, or a planet warming material in the air, I don't think that comparison is fair. Uh, because yes, it can absorb all that heat, but its secondary impacts on the, uh, on the planet are really, really minute. So I, I don't think that comparison is fair, but yes, I haven't mentioned it anywhere. So thank you for bringing this up, Azan. Water in the atmosphere, on the planet, anywhere in the earth, um, in reality, has the ability to absorb water, so, right? So when it is solid, how it's compact, when it's li liquid, and then when you heat it up, how it keeps absorbing heat until it releases those uh, wafers into the atmosphere or turns into um, the gaseous form and can have all of those forms are something that I think everybody knows. So I didn't really focus on that, but I was hiding that information on purpose. But since you brought it up, yes, water too is warming our planet and a lot of counter uh, climate change discussions being on that. But that's my reason to not bring it up. So the purpose of like sharing this or like bringing this up is to make uh, uh, is to accept the fact that most of the stu students that we have in the class are uh, from uh, non-science backgrounds. So at least they should know that this fact that water vapor is also a major contributor in yeah. greenhouse. Yeah, but they aren't an air pollutant, 
right? They are contributed to DHG. Uh, yeah. they, are, they are contributed yeah. to but, warming the planet, but they are not um, pollutant. So I think yeah, obviously they are not. They are not air pollutant, but they are causing global warming as well. They are. As well. I'm, 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 not, I'm not going to to disagree with you. Okay, but thanks for bringing this up because I think I have never mentioned it in the class. Um, and then, of course, let's then not talk about too much about the combustion process, but we basically in the incinerator using certain factors um, burning things up. And the process of burning is not always good because sometimes, like we said, organic waste can be burnt, but not everything that's burnt and not all the products that are being uh, produced are um, are good for the planet. Sometimes the byproduct is more dangerous. And I think I've given an example of uh, phosphagene or something on the side, which you can read. Um, this is a lecture that I want to, I want you to recall lecture five. Maybe you can think about it again. Um, this, uh, so basically this will now bring me to the point on uh, biofiltration process. And I think this is the most important with, because I think all the other things are more, uh, chemical engineering or maybe mechanical and chemical engineering in combination to um, keep our environment clean. But here it's sort of that interface that, that us environmentalists like, right? Where you're not only thinking design and you're not only thinking physical filtration. So not only physical treatment, not only chemical treatment, but also biological treatment. So thinking about mimicking nature and using those um, microorganisms or fungi or plants or trees that can do the job for you as well. Uh, but in moderation, like I, I like to use the word moderation everywhere. So basically what you would do, for example, is in the same scrubber, you could have in the packed medium, uh, peat compost that you produce at home, that could be your bed. Uh, where you grow microorganisms and those microorganisms will have the ability to degrade, let's say methane, uh, sulfur dioxide, H2S gas, et cetera. So that, that's how it's, it's designed, but it's not as easy as you, you, you would think. There are a lot of experiments that, that have to go in to bring it from the environment to the lab to kind of sometimes genetically engineer it or to um, know the exact conditions, right? Because sometimes isolating them from the environment is also not easy. Then to find the right conditions, the optimum conditions for the bacteria to thrive, grow, continuously grow, to get rid of that pollutant is a principle that biologists have to develop alongside that material or design to ensure that the environment remains clean. And when, when you have that, those conditions, I don't think it's difficult to establish a similar setup elsewhere. And, and of course you would, you know, if it's aerobic bacteria, it would need oxygen. If it's anaerobic bacteria, it would need um, no, no oxygen at all. Then you would maintain the pH, the moisture, everything else that's important or which, for whichever bacteria you are thinking about. Generally in treating pollutants specifically for industrial wastewater and industrial air, uh, the, the word biofilm comes a lot. And biofilm is basically the thin film or the thin layer which of bacteria or fungi or anything else that would be formed uh, on a surface. And uh, I think I mentioned it before as well. There's an interesting equation where bacteria grow and then you know they grow on a the surface. Then on top of that, another layer of bacteria grows. On top of that, another layer of bacteria grows. And what happens is that you have this nice aerobic anaerobic population growing in to take it, to take care of the pollutants. So they're simultaneously coexisting to get rid of the pollutants that we have produced, where the ones that are inside have matured, um, are growing without oxygen and light and treating one kind of pollutant and the ones that are on the surface are thriving, growing fast. Um, the ones that are inside are growing slow. Um, and then they are trying to treat a particular pollutant in the environment for us. If you want me to talk more about it, I can talk more about it if you want me to jump. You know, so, so I've given some conditions, some examples here for you to follow as well. So if, if anybody has a comment, any example, any question, you are more than welcome to ask. No? Okay. So I think now I have another question for the chemical uh, people, which is, I've been using generic terms. And to be honest, I should be should have expanded a lot of them. So for example, because 
even these terms, I think you didn't familiarize yourself a lot with yourself. So uh, for example, volatile organic carbons is a, a set of, of elements and they are, even those are categorized in different categories. So when I say we are using biofilter or a bio scrubber to get rid of volatile organic compounds from the air of an industry, it basically means uh, you know, one of these many chemicals or maybe few of these um, chemicals, uh, the, the entire list. And of course, they've categorized it. You probably hear benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, et cetera, a lot. Uh, and, and, and then the others like chloroform, which, which are used in the labs and stuff. But why is everybody so quiet? But yeah, so basically what I wanted to do here is make that combination between biofilter or that technology where microorganisms are used and bring in a complex set of chemicals. So let's say we're talking about volatile organic compounds and we are saying that these could be degraded by microorganisms. Now, why do we want to rely on biological processes? Because it, it can be done in situ. In situ means wherever the pollutant is. Right, so on, on source at home. And then it's inexpensive. Like I said, you don't pay a bacteria for doing the job. You just make the conditions right and they do it. You only need to provide the, the right conditions for them and you need to give bacteria the time or fungi the time to acclimatize into the, that environment and then put it in that particular place. So for example, when you hear a, a, a solution of bacteria was sprayed on wastewater or sprayed on the soil to to, uh, to take care of something, it would probably have been acclimatized and then just it's growing, it's thriving, and then you put it in a certain environment where there's pollutant and it takes um, care of it. And if everything else goes well, like if the nutrients and all the other conditions are there, it should be able to grow very well. And uh, should I talk? So I, I just want to credit the bacteria because I always keep saying bacteria, bacteria, and I never really put a name. Um, well, I do sometimes, uh, but you know, there, there can be all kinds of bacteria that would treat these volatile organic compounds for you, sometimes in certain processes. Again, the, the names would be easy for biologists and scientists, but um, you, you can know that these aerobic and anaerobic compounds are basically hitting those um, chlorines uh, away from these volatile organic car carbons and replacing that with hydrogen and rendering them less toxic for the environment. Any questions? Yes, Daniel. And which volatile compounds were you just referring to in the last slide? In the last slide, I was referring to the first group. So I just picked a few of these. Um, and let's say, so I said chlor chlorinated ethenes, right? And I was saying that basically these bacteria, whether they're aerobic or anaerobic, what they do is knock off the chlorine and give them hydrogen. So for example, this, uh, this particular one, a D sulfetobacterium, they, they would dehalogenase. And of course they have a, an enzyme that does it for them. And I think Pate mentioned it somewhere, so I just didn't want to highlight it. But uh, a particular bacteria which has the right gene to, to do that job, would do it in the right environment when, when it's given that, that job. So yeah, for those chlorinated uh, ethenes. And then for BTEX, I think I, I repeat it again. Uh, my, my personal favorite bacteria, Pseudomonas, it, it does the job everywhere. Um, so for BTEX, I think Pseudomonas, Erginosa, Putida, uh, and Nitrosomonas species have been very effective in, in taking care of them in the environment and they're quite well known. But others like bacillus, et cetera, also do their job and they're easily found in the environment as well. Does that answer the question, Daniel? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Now, is, is Hanan here today? Oh, is, is Hanan here today? No, he isn't. Because he's submitted an assignment on electronic electric vehicles. And um, so we have again discussed this, but I'm only putting it here for you to know uh, that when you look at them from outside, they would all be the same. Uh, so some of them have combustion engines, catalytic converters, uh, converting the fuel, um, driving your cars, or hybrid that contain both the electric battery and the fuel or the electric vehicles. And all they contain is, is the battery, which could be recharged. Um, 
In terms of environment, I think what we haven't really discussed is the fact that a car and its manufacturing process is very GHG um, emission intensive as well. Uh, and oftentimes people who disagree with the uh, rise of el electric vehicles are using this card saying that the manufacturing process is also GHG emission intensive. But I think, and then there is another narrative and that narrative is the batteries use, um, which are the lithium ion batteries. Um, they also use very rare uh, elements such as cobalt. Cobalt is a rare earth um, element, right? Or rare earth metal. And so if, if you're extracting them and it's already rare, then how do we make sure that if we want to increase their numbers in future, or if we want to increase the supply by also increasing the demand by creating education and awareness, then can we really extract that much uh, from the environment? And, uh, and of course, these, these are all the debates, but a lot of researchers have proved that even if all of those um, taking them out of the earth, um, filtering them, using them in the batteries, manufacturing the car, produces GHG emission, in the longer run, electrical vehicles are still, or electric vehicles are still better than the um, simple fossil fuel or hybrid cars. And of course, a hybrid car is better than the, the fossil fuel cars. Now, why should we worry so much about cars? Because unfortunately, we have designed our cities for cars. Um, and I think that's why at some point I wanted to discuss urbanization, but I, I will not because we don't have time. Uh, but this is what happens when you design your cities for cars. So now, no matter what happens, we have to have um, these, this, this demand for, for rising cars because um, you know, public service transport has, has its limitation. But there's also something that there, there's an interesting comparison. And of course, the, the second thing after fossil fuel use would be to improve its efficiency. And um, a lot of people say that the, even though a lot of fossil fuel is used in a power plant, because it's used in a bigger setup and you can take care of it, and on the other hand, the fossil fuel that's used in a car, that engine has a lot of waste heat, et cetera, it's actually less efficient compared to that power plant. So if a lot of cars are put together and compared for use of fossil fuel, a car would be more inefficient than, than, than a power plant. So I think, you know, as someone who knows what's going where, you just need to, uh, to think about these um, as well. And, and of course, there's the hydrogen fuel car. It's, it still is a long shot. Even the electrical vehicles, um, even though they're being produced by Tesla and others, um, still need a, a much bigger market. And of course, hydrogen fuel cell, where hydrogen is used to power an electric car needs, the, um, needs to grow as well. Okay, I wanted to discuss this, but maybe I can let that go. How much time do we have? Right, so you have five minutes. How many of you have seen a brick kiln? I haven't, so I, I had, I, it was really hard for me to, to propose. Very good. Right, okay. So basically, like I think Hassan said, we have to also look at the raw material and we also have to look at our alternatives. Now we are saying that most of these fired uh, clay bricks are a necessity here. For example, in our area, we just use the cemented bricks. Uh, but apparently um, they are more expensive compared to these and because these are cheap, that's why these are being used. I'm not sure about all the other like, comparisons, uh, but that could be one alternative. But then the other alternative is to make the, these kilns efficient and sustainable, right? Uh, so I'm going to ask you to quickly use your search skills to find out what is exact technology and how is it improving the clay production or clay manufacturing? How is it rendering it clean, basically? So what is being used? Like the name's clear. Of course, something's coming in is zigzag and then leaving the kiln. But how does that make uh, the, the process better? So do you want to do it at the end or do you want to do it now? Now, okay. So you have, oh, I have such, such a little time. Okay, you have three to four minutes to search this.
if anybody knows anything about Brickens, anyone who's visited it recently and can point out the, you know, what it, how does it operate? Why is it good or not good? They can also kind of just talk. Nadi, do you want to talk? Uh, no, 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 sorry. It is from the earlier. Okay. Dean's raised his hand, I think. Yes, ma'am. I have. I'm done with the research. So, if you want me to talk about it, so I can. Go ahead, Adi. Uh, can we get two minutes more, please? You can. You can do it. The rest of you, but Adi can talk. We also want to hear. Okay. Adin, why don't you type it? And then why don't all of you who found the answers type it and I'll choose the best one to, um, to talk. Only one person. Okay. Okay, we need to get it going. And yes, you guys are right. So basically, you're increasing the length, the path. And um, yeah, so they're just placed straight in line here. You're allowing for it to zigzag, 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 and then finally go up. So whatever heating process you're using, you're allowing it to be used and reused. And then finally, it you know, just emits out um, at the end of the pipe. Excellent. Right. So it took me a while to understand it because I had to go and look at the design of a, of a brick kiln and see what does it look from inside. And then, you know, then I was able to understand it, but you guys are clearly more intelligent. Um, so if you get a chance to go to brick kiln again, I would definitely request you to just go in and see what, what's in there. But yeah, so basically we're trying to cover all the sources of smoke that we mentioned in one of our initial presentations. Here, I think we should definitely mention what is the alternative to all the dirty fuels. We've already talked about them, so I'll just highlight it. Someone has raised their hand. Atka, is it you? Um, yes, I just wanted to add uh, something. Go ahead. Like, from the economic point of view, like I wanted to talk about this exact technology that, um, you know, uh, it is said that the return on investment uh, when using zigzag technology, it can be achieved within a very short period of time. And in Pakistan, 
um like because of smog crisis and winters especially like um in punjab so the punjab what the punjab government did was that it used to just shut down uh, the traditional brick kilns um mm-hmm. which obviously resulted in uh, millions of like a loss in millions of rupees so with um this particular technology um it is reported that um the brick kilns can actually run throughout the year as well so you know it's economically very beneficial yes absolutely so thank you guys for going through the process um and searching it and contributing to the class uh basically we've also discussed something else which is biogas and biogas is a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide we use it um but we can also kind of prepare it uh using our waste food um and this particular case study i came across recently it's also done in in a bio student who's who's now a doctor in um one of the villages in hunza where he basically used that of course you study the advanced designs in in school but when he went there he used all of those principles built that setup allowed for the slurry to leave um created that dome shape um allowed for a pipe to leave and then um you know he's written all of his optimized conditions like what are the temperature requirements what were the phd requirements and at the end of the day he was not going to be able to get gas but also the the waste that came out was fertilizer so bio fertilizer for 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 his crops um so yeah i i found it interesting and then i thought i'll share it with you again we were talking about alternatives to fuel um and we you know we've mentioned it so i'm not discuss this in in detail and this is also um recalling your lecture 11 where we looked at bioethanol which is another liquid fuel that can also be used as a cleaner fuel compared to fossil fuels uh and lastly i hope this is lastly uh we also said that you know of course uh, we said that some of it we we say that comes uh, trans boundary Now, which is why i wanted to just discuss how the weather patterns would change the flow of particulate matter but i leave that um for for today's class we are burning uh, the paddy fields what is the solution and you've all discussed it and i've kind of given you a hint as well can anyone raise their hand and tell me how would you reduce the waste not just smog but also all other particles that are coming out of agriculture any anyone remembers so basically you harvest the rice and then whatever remains because it's hard to take out they just burn it and then kind of make it make that a part of the soil again and generally it is found to be useful for the soil at least some farmers find it useful for the soil and it reduces work load for them but this has been uh, this has been um mentioned as one of the biggest sources of smog in in the in delhi and lahore and and this this area as well so who knows what the solution is and we've discussed it for in four lectures in different ways rafi did you raise your hand or or was that yes go ahead so oh, i raised my hand and then uh, nadia mentioned uh, merchant like i was about to say and uh, and also that uh, you know when you asked that how we prevent Are you asking uh okay, how are you asking about transboundary uh solution No I'm just asking let's say there's a rice so there is something that we've talked about a lot and the farmer also said so mulching is covering the soil yes but this soil has remains of a product in the soil yeah. and now they want their soil to be suitable for agriculture again Um, there is something that we discussed in the agriculture that I don't know why I'm forcing you guys to remember it. Do, do you? Okay, you don't have to remember it. So basically, when we said that the sustainable or nature-inspired agriculture aims towards no-till technology or zero-till, um, and that we are not, which means that we're not using a tractor or something else to kind of uproot the soil and uproot the plants, no, topple the soil and uproot the plants, we're basically just allowing for the you know we, the, the, whatever we're using we're only using it to put our paddies or fresher paddies or uh, seed in it and we don't take the older crops out and then they just decay naturally and become a part of the soil so you don't have to burn it which means that what you've studied in agriculture 
also has a role in air pollution. And I just wanted you to make that connection here. And, um, and yeah, I mean, you can, you can look at it at, at various ways, composting, yes, using fertilizers on source, yes, but like in, in terms of agriculture, I think it's zero till or no till, which was a part of, um, you know, the sustainable agriculture and now it's growing. So we, we said it, it had already started in the 90s and at the 70s, the only thing that's shifted is now you're using tractors that are only putting the seeds in without disturbing the overall soil because they are carbon dioxide sinks as well. And when you try and irrigate it, when you disturb the soil, all of the carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere. Nadia has a question or a point. Uh, Ma'am, uh, this you said that people should not take out the residue of the, of the previous uh, crops. But ma'am, uh, there must have been some advantages of taking the residual of that plants, right? Otherwise, why would they take on uh, such a hard work and task in order to, I mean, for their cultivation or the agriculture? Yeah, so basically it's convenience, Nadia. And it's factory, you know what I was saying? It's monoculture. If you want to practice monoculture and if you want the machines to do that for you, you just disturb the soil um, use the same kind of equipment, use the same kind of seeds, and then irrigate or practice agriculture over a longer space of time. But you, if you're more considerate of the environment, and like I said, when you disturb the soil, the soil quality decreases because we said that the top thin layer has all the beneficial microorganisms and the beneficial nutrients, and you know, most of the compost lies there, lies there as well, or most of the peat lies there. So if you disturb it, you're kind of also disturbing the life that's inside it. But apart from that, the carbon sink that it created, the carbon that was stored in the soil oxidizes and it is released back into the atmosphere. And, and so it is multiple disadvantages. What we looked at with, with the farmer, with um, nature inspired agriculture was the fact that we don't need to do this. We, all we need is for the um, um, soil to just go in and, and, you know, uh, and, and be able to grow. The rest of it can naturally decay and become a part of the soil and can also act as a not only pest reducer, but also a cover for the soil. And on top of that, the roots, when they go into the soil, can be, uh, you know, can penetrate and, and provide extra space for life and oxygen and nutrient um, or, or water absorption into the soil. Now, the problem with soil, uh, uh, rice paddies, sorry, is that they are hard to take out. And that's why they burn it. If they were easy to take out, they wouldn't, they would probably just take it out. But it's hard to take it out and that's why they burn it because it's easy. But we know that burning has consequences. I think we need to change the practice. And the practice part is what we had discussed in the agriculture. That whatever we are talking about, it wasn't just limited to agriculture and biota and natural environment, but also the fact that these practices could then uh, keep our air clean too. So, so again, those multiple um, actions with, with nature-inspired practices. How much time do I have? One minute to conclude the lecture, uh, if you bear with me for another minute. So basically, I was just looking at quick um, startups, and I found a lot of start startups from India, uh, and that's maybe because they also have a lot of smoke. Uh, but basically, uh, there are these, this one I really liked because they also call it the Jugard purifier because the guy who developed it was of course a foreigner studying in China and when he found out that the purifiers are, the air purifiers are really expensive, he found out what's in it, it was a HEPA filter which is high efficiency particulate air filter, a finer filter. He just put it with his normal fan and that basically acted as a purifier for him. And he then is now, he commercialized it and he's selling it. And similarly, there are many, many startups that are using the soot or that, that carbon that's coming out uh, from diesel, from other practices to make high quality ink, high quality paint, uh, etc. So basically reusing the source. Uh, there are a lot of other startups that are creating education and awareness, startups that are giving the industries the data and analytics of the air quality. Uh, for them to be you know, inspired about taking um, actions. And then of course, um, the same using the pollution on source as a resource 
And uh, this one, I think I found it in interesting. This is some of IIT guys who've used uh, nanotechnology, uh, which is fine nanoscale particles, which they just put with, uh, on their nose. It's like nasofilter that acts as a filter for your nose. So you don't have to wear the mask. Um, so these small interventions, which of course must have taken uh, for them a lot of time to develop these basic prototypes, but I just also wanted to think outside of uh, uh, industries and vehicles and uh, agriculture and all the normal things that we've generally discussed in the class, but also think about others. Uh, and of course, uh, plant, um, as, as Eminent said, life. So uh, pure air purifying plants inside the house or outside the house, across the roads, whatever. Um, they will also improve the environment. And bio-based things, biofertilizers, biopesticides, composting in your house, keeping your vehicle regulated, changing the oil, cleaning the filter, or changing the filter as well, and then uh, making sure that your vehicle isn't sitting idle because it's said that a lot of the emissions actually come from the traffic light time, so that time where they're waiting rather than the time where they actually travel. So there's a lot of stand-up time that costs us a lot of uh, pollution as well. So just some of the things that I wanted to highlight, I think that's it from me. If you have any questions you're more than, or comments, you're more than welcome to make it now. And meanwhile, I'll read comments. Hassan. I just wanted to make a comment where we previously talked about electric cars and how in the long run they will reduce emissions. But the fact that you just talked about signals and how the waiting time takes a very long, uh, you know, a very long time. Tesla currently is trying to implement something where there's basically a mesh of cars and each, every car is connected in the network. So uh, before even reaching a junction, the cars know uh, which other car is approaching. So they adjust their speed in such a way that it minimizes the waiting time. So they can just pass by each other without ever colliding. And they don't need any waiting time at all for signals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course there are a lot of narratives, but I think, yeah, it, I mean, it's interesting that you guys think, think about those things as well and those interventions as well about how these cars can also be designed smartly to operate in any case, the car is not going to pollute. You know, it doesn't have end of the pipe. So remember we talked about end of the pipe for factories and brick kilns. An electric car doesn't have a pipe. It just has a battery. You know? it's, it's like your mobile phone. It does, it's not going to have a, 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 an emission source. But it might have indirect emission sources based on where the electricity is coming from. And of course, that's the biggest question. So, but, but a lot of people still say that even after that, because the, uh, the fossil fuel run cars are less efficient uh, and the electric cars are not, um, they, they might still benefit the environment more. And of course, because I, I want cleaner technology to come in, so I'm a pro EV, um, but you know, there are all kinds of narratives and, and some of that makes sense. So depends, depending on which country you're in, so for example, for Pakistan, we might be using the dirtiest coal for, for developing electricity. And if that electricity is going in into the electric vehicle, if that electric vehicle is going past a fossil fuel run car, I would still believe that because that fossil fuel car has end of a pipe, it would probably um, be better than that. And, and of course there are scientific, like there's in researchers and numbers and, and, uh, and data analysis that shows that. And I want to believe it. So I do believe it. But yeah, did I actually, I, I understood your point, right? Did, did I mess that up? Did I mess up what you wanted to say? No, 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 that was right. Okay, okay, thanks, Hassan. Anybody else? I just need to send a private message to some people I want to stay back. Any other comments, guys, before we leave? No? Okay. Nadia, do you have a question? Uh, no, ma'am. No. Okay. Is my hand raised again? Yes, it is. <laughs> ma'am? Yeah, who's that? 
Um, Atika, ma'am, I just uh, I have just one very small question. Um, in which year did the Punjab government? Um, I think it happened in the Punjab that they banned, um, as a Jinbi rickshaws or pay motorcycles. Say there was a lot of emission, even even cars. So they imposed a fine. So um, which time period was that exactly? I think it was recently. I last last year or the year before because rickshaws are still run, running in Lahore. So maybe they must have checked it. It must have been an intervention. I know in Islamabad they did once did this drive where every vehicle's emission was checked, and vehicles were fined. Some people paid it. Some people monopolized and didn't pay it. But because I'm very new in Lahore, I don't know. But I know that last year there was a lot of uproar. Uh, by the activists on this, and I think the court had done something. They shut down the kilns. They, I think, this year they're also finding the kilns um, and asking them to stop as well. Which I don't think is a fair solution, but but you know, um, but I think the last two or three years have been more active for for smog than than the years before. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.